Right, hi everyone, my name's Matthew Waters. Hang on. There we go, Matthew Waters, and I work for BDL Steel Weld. Now, as you can probably tell by the logo, we are a Dutch company, part of the wider VDL group, which has something like 20,000 employees. I'm actually part of Steel Weld UK, which is a far, far smaller company. I think we have about 25 permanent staff, though a few more contractors. And we work mainly in the automotive sector. And our business is designing and project managing the installation of car assembly lines. Um, now, historically, clients of ours have been Volvo, Rover, Ford, but last few years it's pretty much all been JLR. They're booming at the moment. Um, now, car assembly lines are predictably really complex systems. They're very big, they have contain many parts, there's an awful lot going on there. They're tying in lots of kit from lots of different manufacturers, suppliers, there's hardware, there's software. So there's a, an awful lot to manage there. Core skills, I've listed some here, are process design, so we determine the best way in, to build a car, basically. Um, tool design, obviously everything here is bespoke, pretty much. Uh, so that's all sort of laid up in 3D, Robcad studies, all that kind of thing first. Simulation, we use DES quite heavily, and obviously that's the focus of the talk today. And insulation and training, once we've delivered a, a plant, a, a line, then we'll get the JLR guys, the maintenance crew, uh, and operators up to speed on how to run it efficiently. Um, I've kind of forgotten a big one there, which is actually the project management, um, actually overseeing the installation of this. I mean, some of the bits of kit and the systems that are going down uh, going into the line have long lead times, they're really complex bits, uh, things. So managing that effectively is a hell of a challenge. And for the best one in the world, things go wrong, suppliers let you down, software doesn't match hardware, things change. So yeah, it's difficult business. Okay, so simultaneous engineering. Um, in my opinion, this is the most interesting part of the project, and it comes pretty early on. Now, it may or may not surprise you to learn that cars and the facilities that build them are kind of designed in tandem, or at least in part in tandem. And when you think about it, that's a perfectly rational approach to take. Um, car assembly plants are fantastically expensive things. I mean, they cost hundreds of millions of euros. It's a severe capital outlay. Um, so if you can engineer the design of the car so it makes it easy to build and you can reduce the amount of kit that's required to build it, you can save yourself an awful lot of money. Um, the reverse is also true. You want this car to be able to be built reliably, cheaply, quickly, uh, in a robust way. So optimizing the car design in order to be able to pump out as many units as possible is also a big win. Okay, uh, before we start an SE phase, there are certain things we need to know. Um, we need to know whether it's a new vehicle, completely new platform, or whether it's carried over. Uh, is it based on another car? Is it an evolution of a, an existing uh, line? Um, it's not uncommon to build multiple uh, types of car down the same production line. They need different tooling, they have different fixtures and grippers, but they can share robots, they can share guns, they can share turntables, things like that. We'll also need to know number of models, derivatives, so things like does it have a moonroof, fixed roof, that kind of thing, and what ratios uh, do you want to build these cars in. We need to know volumes, that's absolutely key, uh, when the plant's operating. Targets, uh, so always there are targets. Um, these bits of kit, robots, guns, are really expensive, so you really want to make them work hard, sweat the assets. Uh, you also need to know plant... Ah, hang on, let me just take a glass of water there. Plant specifics, so whether it's a new site or whether we're chopping into an old line and modifying it, because that radically changes the type of project, project it is. Uh, you need to know things like floor loadings, so where can we put our heaviest bits of kit, where are the air supplies, um, all that kind of thing. We need to know the, what the metal tree looks like. Now, this is one of the things that's given to us quite early on. Um, it's also one of the things that gets edited 
quite heavily. Um, now this is basically a how-to guide of how to put the car together. Now it's delivered to us in all sorts of 3D virtual packages, beautifully rendered. Um, I mean, it's kind of like one of those IKEA manuals for flat pack furniture with your little stick men, but it doesn't come with any instructions. And if we think it's best, we can make modifications to it. Um, so it, that's really all it is. It's just about the product. It doesn't tell you anything about the tooling. It doesn't tell you anything about the build order, which panel goes on first, which one do you offer up, do you build skin up or skin down. So all of that is left up to us to decide. And other things we, we like to know as uh, material planning and logistics and um, project timing costs, so how much th things are going to cost when they want the first build to be, when the plant has to be delivered by, basically. Um, all of these are the, thing, the sorts of things we would love to know going into an SE phase. Uh, in practice, we're lucky if we get about 90% of those, and they often tend to wibble about somewhat as we're going through the SE phase itself, which is somewhat frustrating. So here we are with SE. Now SE is very much a, an iterative process. Um, and at various stages uh, during an SE project, we fix uh, the builds. Um, that's the, the red dots there. We're going around the SE phase. And simulation is a big part of this. Uh, you can't ignore the other things that go on around, the, the process, the, the way in which we put all these panels together to build up the shell of a car. Uh, but everything does tie into the DES. Um, a fully simulated plant, which is hopefully what we get at, at, right in the center there, FD day, final day of judgment. Uh, <laughs> that's our, our last build phase, is a fully simulated plant. And that's used effectively as our buy-off criteria. Now, when we deliver a factory, uh, a line, it's, they're never going to be able to ramp it up to 100% right away. It's, it's far too noisy, it's far too complex. But what they can do is use this model to benchmark against that. So if the plant operates in, in small sections in the same way that the model does, then we've satisfied our buy-off criteria and we get paid. Okay, so like I said, SE is very much a an iterative process, and the first thing, first pass of the DES is a block layout diagram, effectively. It's kind of a toy model. Um, here we have one, I mean, the, the shape of this process flow is very much determined by the bill of process of the car. Um, this is a two-stage framer, so uh, zones nine and 10 produce a body side, inner, and then, then at zone 22.1, I don't know if you can see that there, uh, that's framed, uh, offered up to an underbody and stitched on. Zones 11 and 12 build a body side outer, and then at the second framer, 22.2a, uh, that's tacked on as well. So that's very much the first stage. And like I said, it's a toy model, it's very quick. These zones are modeled as machines. I'll base downtime on past projects generally, or you know, sort of hand waving. Uh, kind of figures. I don't know enough to do anything else at this stage. Um, second bit of this is to try and get better estimates for downtime. Um, and what we'll start to do at this phase is to sketch up a process. It's clear, purely a blackboard exercise. Sketch up a process which we think will be able to turn however many aluminium panels into something, uh, an assembly that we can then use elsewhere in the build. And we'll estimate the amount of kit that's required to do that. Um, we're not too heavy on detail at this stage. We're not worried about the tooling or the layouts or anything like that. It's just what do we think is going to be required to produce this assembly in this, sort, in this rough cycle time. And um, from that, we use this very <laughs> hand-wavy kind of equation at the top there to estimate technical availability and hence downtime. Right, after that, I would then calculate uh, a static cycle time. Um, at this stage, hopefully, I should know enough about the process, about the car, in order to specify a cycle time for each separate zone, for zones 9, 10, 
11, 12, and the framing. Um, I, I base this on volumes, TA, over speeds, so we want to maintain a push system through this. We build to buffer and plant philosophy. Um, the output is what we call the design cycle time, and it's kind of like the heartbeat of each zone. Now, bits of kit in the zone can obviously run faster than that, but they can't run any slower, else they slow the entire zone down. Okay, the key isn't necessarily, at this stage, uh, accuracy. The accuracy, we don't really know enough to be too detailed about the model at this stage. It's just about speed. I give our process guys a cycle time to work to, and the cycle time that I give them really seriously influences the amount of kit that they would then put into the zone. If it's a short cycle time, the only way you can really get around this is just to throw kit at a problem in order to get your assembly out in time. Okay. Right, second pass. Uh, now, once we've sketched all these things out, we start to flesh out the detail. <coughs> um, this is a schematic diagram of one of those zones uh, containing men loading up uh, parts to turntables, riveting robots, handling robots with grippers, seventh axis robots that slide along pickup parts, serve it to buffers, uh, trunnions, some big <laughs> ferris wheel type things that carry parts over. So there's an awful lot going on there. Um, I'll work really closely with the project, that, with the process team at this stage. I'll advise them uh, on the best way to split up zones into guarded areas, we call machine safety areas, that can break down independently of each other. These are the bits that are fenced off that if a, a, an operator, uh, sorry, a maintenance guy needs to go into to fix, the rest of the cell can keep running. Okay, and here's another schematic of that same zone. Um, it's got station numbers on here, and you can see which resources are shared, so which men load parts to which station, which robots serve both stations. Um, every one of these stations will have, will, will have a Gantt chart associated with it to show what activities it's doing. And that detail is basically what goes into my model. Okay, so once we have a base process uh, and I really start accurately modeling these cells, I need to put better estimates for TA in. Now, we've been collecting for years data about the reliability of the kit that we use to build car assembly lines. And once we have that, a good idea of our schematic, of our layout, and we know what's going in, we can then tot up the reliability of all that kit and get sensible estimations for TA. Where we're using new tools, so bespoke bits of kit, we'll look at the kind of things that we put on the, on the tools and estimate the TA for those as well. And there's a layout. Um, all our layouts are 2D AutoCAD layouts. That's just a small part of the shop. They really are big things. Okay, third pass. Now, once all the zones have been modelled effectively, once I know we can get enough through each zone by itself, I basically take time to stitch it all together. Now, the schematic that I showed you earlier um, kind of becomes the carpet in my model. I'm not very good at making these witness models look pretty. You know, I, I always fall back to the standard yellow boxes and connecting arrows, um, but I can put a carpet underneath and you know, shop layout and just drop my model on top. Uh, and like I said before, the, the final model is the criteria against which the fully installed body shop is judged. Um, JLR actually used this model, or the results of this model, and integrate it into their wider plant models. So I'm, I'm just looking at one part of the shop here, the upper body, um, but underbody models and closure models, so, you know, the pan of the car and the doors and bonnets and boots, uh, that's all someone else, and JLR folds those models into this model. Okay. So, um, these models can get really quite big. The last one you saw was actually a fairly small one. Um, obviously, I wanted to fit it on one slide. 
in enough detail that people could see it. Um, they're big models, so I have to be very consistent about the way I approach this problem. Um, I have very strict naming strategies. I put everything into modules and submodules nested. Um, and I'm very consistent about the way I apply uh, the model as well. Um, all my part handlers, uh, my robots that pick and move parts or turntables or things like that, trunnions, are machines. Um, labor and riveting guns that work across stations I model as labor, uh, but they're labor served by multi-cycle machines. Um, where a shared resource is also part handling, uh, paths are used. This might be the case if you have a gun gripper, so a riveting gun on one side and a gripper on the other, and this gun might work at a couple of stations, this gripper might move it from one to the other. I'll use a path to model that. Um, that's kind of edge case, it doesn't happen too often. Um, and I'm also, I also take great pains to separate data from witness, as I think everyone else who's presented has done so today. Um, it's, you know, when you're entering in a huge number of variables, you don't want to be doing it through the witness model. It's much easier to do it through Excel. Okay, I showed you this block layout diagram earlier. Um, one of the things the DES is used for is to determine buffer sizes. Now, in practice, buffer sizes are constrained in all sorts of different ways, uh, mainly the geography of the shop, um, where we can fit lines in, and how to get from part, uh, section A to section B. But I thought it was a nice thing to do as an optimization problem. Um, I said this was a, a little toy model that I had at, at one stage. And to determine optimum buffer sizes, what I did was built a, a little algorithm, a genetic algorithm, to find the ideal solution here. Um, this was a VBA script, which oversaw the execution of the model. And at the start of every model run, it changed the buffer sizes via WCL commands. Um, the fitness metric was the output of the model, so how many cars I was pumping out over a certain period of time. Uh, which the VBA script collected, uh, plugged into the GA, and modified buffer size accordingly. Um, I've since found out that Witness Optimizer does pretty much the same thing, uh, probably does it a lot more easily and coherently than this one did. Uh, I don't think this is a problem that scales particularly well. Even in my toy model, um, it took the best part of a day to run. There's a, a, a lot of generations there. Um, Maybe Witness Optimizer would do that a lot better, but I think the minute I started putting serious detail into the model, just the scale of it blows an optimization thing away. That makes it unfeasible. Okay, uh, that kind of concludes it, really. Uh, we use simulation quite heavily as a tool uh, within the simultaneous engineering phase. Uh, we work tightly with JLR. Uh, we're based on site most of the time. We feed the results of our simulation to them. Uh, it's also used as the buy-off criteria for us, so we don't get paid unless our shops, our final installed shops, work in the same way that our model does.